update. Am I the a-hole for assuming I'd inherit my mother's house? Original story. My female twenties mother raised me and my sister twenties as a single parent in a single income household. We rented our whole lives and grew up low middle class. We never went without food or other essentials, but didn't have the luxuries of many wants. I started investing when I was 17 through my mother, and have been somewhat successful through it. I have accumulated enough money to afford a down payment on a house in our neighborhood slash city. I have decided to pursue a second degree at college to further my career slash job opportunities, and currently have a part-time job which is not enough to support a mortgage. I currently rent with a roommate. Me and my mother have an extremely good relationship. And I used to joke growing up that when I'm older and have money, I'd buy a house and let her live with me so she doesn't have to worry about her living situation, slash a mortgage, slash paying rent when she's older. I told my mother about my plan to buy a house, and pitched the idea that I'd give her the money as a down payment, and she'd pay the mortgage. She has a very stable job now and can afford to keep up on mortgage. The down payment was the issue as she didn't have enough save to afford our city. She didn't want to feel burdened to me, but I really want to do this for her. I would move in and contribute some money to rent for utility slash mortgage. It's a beneficial situation for both of us. Eventually, in 20 plus years, when my mom retires or whenever she wants to retire, I should have a stable career and be able to take over the remainder of her mortgage, if she still had one. We all agreed on this, and both extremely excited about starting the process. I was fine with the house being in my mother's name, but this is where the conflict came up. When I agreed for it to be in my mother's name, it was because I'd still be able to live there would inherit it in the future, and it would eventually be in my name anyway. My mother disagreed, and said she would leave it to both me and my sister 50-50. I don't understand as my sister was not contributing financially to this house while I was. I told my mother that I would not give her the money for a down deposit if I didn't solely inherit it in the future. She called me selfish for making her leave my sister with nothing, but I disagree. My sister has never had much focus or priority on her future or career. It is quite materialistic. She hardly saves, and has a boyfriend who she'll 98% marry eventually and have children with. I personally want to be child-free, and knowing my sister, she'll believe she's more deserving as she will have a family. Also, if she knew about my mother and I were buying a house but still inheriting it in the future, there is a zero chance she'd save for her own place. She'd wait till our mother passed and assume she'd be able to move in. Am I the a-hole for demanding slash assuming I'd inherit my mother's house? Edit. Sorry for not clarifying. I'd be paying the deposit plus at least 40% of the mortgage over time. My bank denied my application for a loan. Now for the top comments before reading the update. Tough call to be honest. But why don't you save yourself the headache and put the house in your name and charge your mom rent? Thank you for the advice. Honestly, I never considered that. I just wanted her to have the security of knowing she owned a house. Something she'd always talked about as we grew up. I might have a talk with her about this option, though. I think this would be the best option. She still has security, but you retain ownership. I would never put money into a house without it being in my name. I don't care if your mother agrees with you and everything today. She can change her mind at any time, and God knows what her will says if she has one. I wholeheartedly trust her, but now I'm reconsidering not having my name on a deed. She just knows more about these sorts of things, and I figured it would be easier. Don't trust her. This is a huge investment. Put your name on a house, even if she swears she will leave you the house in full eventually. If you don't get your name on a deed, you will regret it. Not day home. Wait until you can fully afford a home in your name. Then buy your home and allow mom to move in. My mom wants to buy a house now and is already looking three hours plus outside of the city. She wants to stay in the city but is financially scared about not owning a house at her age. I'm now seriously considering buying a house in my name, but don't think I'm as desirable to the bank for a loan as my mother is, as I'm still in school. And now for the update. To start this off, I have decided to not purchase a house at this moment. I sat down to talk about this decision with my mom and gave the following requests that would make me comfortable with purchasing a house with her. 1. Both our names would be on a deed slash mortgage with a joint tenancy. This would mean that when either of us passed, it would automatically be passed on to the other and not counted as estate. This was the one I liked the best. 2. I donate a portion of the down deposit, not all, and consider it a gift. 3. After discussing with an estate lawyer and financial advisor, we do it in a very legal way with signed documents and everything, dictating my percentage, my mother's, maximum payoff my sister could receive if I wanted to buy her share, saw this in a comment, etc. 
I said I would only consider this option if my percentage was 51% or above. Both names of the mortgage indeed. Four, nothing, and we both do our own thing. My mother took the day to discuss these options and said she didn't feel comfortable not leaving anything for my sister when she passes. And like a lot of you guys said, I realized we just aren't compatible. I tried to tell her why I wanted it this way, so I would have financial security in the future, but also so I could help her. But she said I was being heartless to not consider my sister's future. She tried to negotiate option three, but it's only 50% guaranteed to me. I know that selfishly that's not a beneficial situation for me to be in, but I just can't bring myself to agree to that. I would pay for all of the deposit than 40% of the mortgage and still just get half even if I didn't do the following. This would also set me back years to buy a house I would actually own. I was also worried after reading comments that she would go and leave her portion to my sister, making it 50-50 anyway. My mother said I was selfish for going back in my word and forcing her to choose between me and my sister, and that I should realize I'm a part of a family before seeing her or my sister again. I feel bad for putting conditions on this offer, but this was never a gift or anything like that. It was an opportunity for both of us to buy a house, but all of our options don't seem to be mutually beneficial. We haven't talked for the past two days, and I don't really see the situation having much more closure to this. My plan is to finish school and work a few years before committing to buying a home, but thank you for all the advice you have given me. I'm sad that it ended like this, but hope not too much damage was done in the long run. Your mother is very worried about the prospect of not leaving an inheritance for your sister, yet it seems to have escaped her notice that if you pay for half of the house and end up with 50% while your sister also gets 50%, she has left nothing to you. You would be tying up a lot of money for decades, missing out on other opportunities for investment in order to facilitate an inheritance for your sister. I think that you're better off not being part of this. Save your resources to buy your own home. Yeah, Opie's mother was definitely planning on leaving her entire half to the sister. I could understand it if the Opie's mother felt that it would be unfair to leave the sister with nothing, but at minimum, the Opie should end up with 75% of the house. The half she would pay for plus half of the mother's half as an inheritance. Given the mother's attitude, I think that the Opie should steer clear. If the mother is determined to make sure that the sister ends up with 50% of the house, she could be capable of doing whatever it takes to achieve this goal, even if it means going against an agreement made with the Opie. For example, even if the house is purchased as joint tenants, the Opie's mother can sever the joint tenancy which would leave them as tenants in common, and she could then wheel her share to the Opie's sister. Likewise, she could promise the Opie whatever percentage of her share she liked, and then make a will leaving everything to the sister. Even if the Opie was able to get her to sign a contract regarding the inheritance of the house, it could cost more than the house would be worth to enforce it in court. The reality is, without you, your mom isn't leaving your sister anything. You are paying for your sister's inheritance. There is no scenario here where you are not transferring your wages to your sister. You're better off just buying your own house in your own name and letting your mom live with you. Yes. I really don't understand why this wasn't the plan all along. Now for the next story. Am I the a-hole for telling my son to get over himself, man up, and stop publicly calling his wife a deadweight? My son and his wife are 25 and 27, and I'm 45. They both worked full-time until a few months ago when his wife had to stop for reasons that aren't mine to share. And my son has become insufferable. It recently culminated in me telling him he needed to stop whining about the situation and man up. I love my son very much, but he's always online posting about how hard he has to work, or going on unprovoked monologues about the stresses of being a family sole breadwinner. He does this openly, doesn't even try to hide it from his wife. It clearly makes her feel bad, or like she's not pulling her weight. Since he also talks about having to do everything around a house that care for his wife since she's on IR for now. I talked to her, and she told me she wasn't bothered by anything but him claiming he does everything at home. Because according to her, he doesn't. When I pointed everything out to him, he said, well, you and her can't understand what it's like to be the sole income of a household, and that he should ask dad, since he could tell you. His father was the sole breadwinner for a long time. I worked to now though, but yes, he knows what it's like. But he, his father, or my father were never this dramatic. I never once heard my husband or dad express any worry over bearing the entire burden. These were men. They didn't do that. They manned up and kept it moving. Sure, they may have felt a little uneasy about it, but they didn't dwell on it. And they certainly didn't belittle their wife's contributions and lie about doing everything at home as well. 
My daughter pointed out that he is my son, and I shouldn't be standing up for his wife if it means putting him down. But I'm just tired of him moaning and groaning in person and online about his situation, along with basically saying his wife is not pulling her weight. At its blow, I've seen several people point out that my dad and husband aren't from this generation and reference today's economy. But I have to point out that my son-in-law is the sole breadwinner and he doesn't badmouth my daughter or whine about things. My 19-year-old nephew works two lower-paying jobs to pay the bills for his girlfriend and their newborn. So it's literally only my son who whines about his situation, while expecting sympathy for staying with his basically helpless wife. It isn't okay with me. I'm not sure what your son thinks he's going to gain by shaming his wife in public like that, but nothing wrong with you telling him to deal with it. He is possibly not thinking tactically, but if he continues, I see divorce in my crystal ball. And all these exaggerating social media posts about being the sole breadwinner are going to be fantastic for Opie's son when it comes time to calculate alimony. No offense, but what planet is your daughter living on? It's okay to love your son unconditionally, but you also can't let him say these sort of things. And the fact that you won't reveal what's wrong with his wife only proves that it's bad, and he shouldn't say these things. Edit. The daughter I'm referring to is the one that Opie mentioned in the final paragraph. Unconditional love means I love you when you're being a jerk and an idiot. Also means I'm going to tell you that you're being a jerk and an idiot. And I'm going to tell you to do better because I know you can be better. Unconditional love doesn't mean that I think the sun shines out your rear end 24-7 and that you leave rainbows in the toilet. The phrase man up is a little outdated. Maybe you could say grow up instead because he's acting like a little brat. Just because you're his mother doesn't mean you have to put him on a pedestal and take his side in every single situation. Good for you for calling him out. Now for the last story. Am I the a-hole for hiring a babysitter to watch my son when my ex had an emergency? My 30 male ex fiance 28 female and I have a 3-year-old son together. We broke off our engagement just over a year ago and have a 50-50 custody split. We split time with our son every two weeks as my ex moved over an hour away and making the drive every week was too much. Since switching to the two-week schedule, it has been better for everyone. I just started dating again a few months ago and I have been seeing someone quite regularly for about six weeks now. This past weekend, we had a date scheduled for Saturday night at a nice restaurant and tickets to go see a show. It was supposed to be our first nice dress-up date, as our previous times together have been more informal, like coffee, walks in the park, bowling, etc. Early Saturday morning, my ex calls me. She's frantic and tells me she needs me to come get our son because she's having a family emergency. Apparently, her sister was in a car accident and she's in a hospital a few hours away. My ex wants to go immediately as it seems pretty serious, but she doesn't want to haul our son with. I agree right away and get to my ex's place as soon as I can. When I get home with my son, I contact my date and let her know that an emergency came up and I now have my son. I apologize and tell her I probably have to cancel our date. She says she understands, but asks if I would consider hiring a babysitter and she has a friend who is a nanny and she might be available. She says we can skip dinner and just go to the show, so that my son will be almost asleep by the time I would have to leave. I think that's a pretty good idea, so she says she will reach out to her friend. Her friend was free and agreed to babysit so I get her contact info and talk over the plan with her. By the time she arrives at my place, my son is already asleep, and I have just enough time to meet my date at the show. I put my phone on silent for the show, and when I checked it after the show ended, my ex had called a few times and left a bunch of texts. I excused myself to call her. She immediately flipped out on me for not answering, and it made her think something terrible happened, especially with her mindset with her sister's accident. I told her that our son was at home asleep with a babysitter as I was out on a date. This made her flip out even more, and she told me if she knew I was going to pawn our son off and a babysitter so I could go on a date, she would have never called me to get him. She said this is a huge breach of trust, and it makes her seriously question my judgment. I told her our son was fine and tried to ask about her sister, but she told me not to try and change the subject. She called me Neho and told me she would be coming to get our son as soon as she can. The whole thing pretty much ruined my evening. My ex got our son yesterday afternoon and we fought about it. I don't think I did anything wrong, but she sure does. Not day home. Adults have lives and sometimes that requires a babysitter to stay home with the kids. Does she expect your son to never ever be without one of you? I'm actually so surprised by the anti responses. There's using a sitter and there's this. 1. Not introducing sitter to the child. 
to having Son fall asleep before the sitter, who is a stranger, shows up. Three not telling child about going out and sitter being there. Edit. Apparently, they tell a kid at least. Four leaving phone on do not disturb, so calls aren't heard during an entire movie. Five having this potentially be the child's first ever experience with a sitter at dad's house. This common say has never used one before. Six. For a three-year-old, this is kind of breaking every rule of getting a sitter. Maybe for an emergency, I could see some of it. But for a date? He's lucky that kid stayed asleep. Had kiddo woken up? It could have been very upsetting. Does she expect her son to never ever be without one of you? This is such a total misrepresentation of the problem here. You're the a-hole. You're the a-hole. Not for the idea of a babysitter, which is how you're trying to position this. One, you never mentioned any scheduled conflict to your ex, so she assumed you would be caring for your son. You should have touched base with your ex when you later decided to keep the date and hire a sitter. That would have given your ex the option to come back if she felt uncomfortable about it. Two, you should have had your phone on vibrate in the movie, so you could at least be aware of your ex, or the babysitter, trying to reach you. Really irresponsible for a parent. Your date night shouldn't supersede your obligation to care for your son, especially when he has never been left with a sitter. And this is a sitter you don't even know. Throw COVID in there as well as a concern. Your girlfriend is an a-hole for suggesting this plan. 